Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the No Bad Dogs podcast, the podcast where we love, live, and work with dogs. Today, I am at the Monks of Newskeet Monastery in Cambridge, New York, surrounded by the rolling hills of the Adirondacks, puppies, monks, sisters, and nuns, and I'm super excited to sit down with Brother Christopher. Brother Christopher has been training uh, dogs professionally for almost 40 years, and it's one of the reasons why I started working with dogs professionally as well. Um, I appreciate you guys so much for following along, and I am very, very excited to have Brother Christopher on the No Bad Dogs podcast. Thank you guys so much for joining me, and welcome, Brother Christopher. Um, we're here in beautiful Cambridge, New York. How far away is this from the Vermont border? We're two miles as... The crow flies. Right. So we're so just on the other side of our property is the Vermont border. Awesome. It's absolutely uh, beautiful out here. Explain to me, because uh, I don't know, and then the people who are listening as well, explain to me a little bit about what a monastery is. And we'll get into dog stuff later, but explain sure. to me what it, what it means to be um, – you know, a brother uh, and 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 be a part of the monks of Newskeet here, and what a monastery's main purpose and and goal is. Sure, within Christianity, ever since the third century, uh, there have been groups of people uh, who have chosen to live together uh, uh, and support one another in their spiritual search. Uh, initially, they went out into the Egyptian desert or the Syrian deserts and uh, lived uh, where they wouldn't be bothered by the social unrest that was going on uh, at that time. But uh, through the centuries, monastics, they were called monks, okay, and the uh, places where they lived – were called monasteries, okay? And so one of the first uh, places where monks got together was in the Egyptian desert. The Greek term was called skitis. Uh, skitis. Skitis. Uh, and it's transliterated as skit. And it came to mean a small group of monks living around a spiritual elder or father who was an experienced monk and who could help teach them how to seek God, okay, and how to make the spiritual search uh, that prime uh, motivating factor of their lives, okay. And through the centuries, monasteries uh, have existed in uh, both Africa, the Mideast, Europe, now here in the United States. Uh, and uh, they all have that similar characteristic. The people that live in monasteries are passionate about the spiritual search. And now we happen to be uh, an Eastern Orthodox monastery. Most people have heard of like Russian Orthodox or Greek Orthodox, and it's all the same faith. But uh, as an Eastern Orthodox monastery here in the United States, uh, we, uh, when we fo were founded in the mid 1960s, New Skeet, you're talking New about? Skeet, yeah, yeah. Uh, we took the term New Skeet, okay, uh, hearkening back to the Egyptian desert and the values of early monasticism, but trying to live. Uh, those values in a contemporary sort of way. And so that's how we got the name Nuskeet. And that gives sort of a, a very general background of uh, Christian monasticism. One thing that obviously people ask us is, you know, are we celibate? Are we single? And yes, we are. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, that's part of uh, our own dedication to God. Here at Nuskeet, uh, we're comprised of two separate communities. We have the, the monks, okay, and there are currently about eight of us, and then the nuns, which they live about three and a half miles away, and uh, they're known for their cheesecakes. Yeah. And there are currently four 
uh, so there's, sisters. Really? So we've always been a small community. Wow, I thought there were there were a lot more for some no, reason. No, we've always been small. And, you know, the truth to tell, monasticism in our culture is pretty count- countercultural. It's something that, you know, if people are aware of it, they have sort of stereotyped attitudes, you know, from Hollywood that, you sure. know, monks are uh, sort of this almost a separate gender. Yeah. You know, well, I think uh, – uh, sorry to interrupt, but I think uh, the, the monks too um, – a lot of people see uh, like the Buddhist monks, right, where right. They're, mm-hmm. they're in the orange and they, they uh, go to the temple and do a lot of the um, meditation and things like that. That's what you normally see in Hollywood. Right. right. right? And, I, and there is a separation between – what what you're doing, but it's still all a form of Christianity or no? Well, yes. I mean, within Christianity, you have uh, monks who have, like I said, always <clears throat> been uh, essentially a part of the tradition. Uh, Buddhism is different. You know, Buddhism is not Christianity. However, there's no doubt that Buddhist monks share many of the same values right. as Christian monks and same with Hindu monks and uh, – you know, so uh, there's a real ability to communicate uh, cross-culturally, you know, with each other. But within Christianity, I think one of the things that has always characterized monasticism is that uh, it's been self-sufficient. And so here at the monastery, uh, ever since the beginning, we have always taken the responsibility of trying to earn our own keep. Mm-hmm. Uh and uh, the way that we've done that, uh, God be praised, uh, early on is we fell into uh, breeding German shepherds and then uh, extending from that training dogs of all breeds. And so we've been doing that since the late 1960s. Okay. So the 1960s is when – so that's when the – because I, I was wondering how the – so the nuns do the cheesecake, right? And then and then you guys, the monks, will do dog training. Right. And that started in the 1960s mm-hmm. with uh, – a, was it was it the breeding program that came first or was it yeah. the training? What – how it happened was uh, when the monastery first began, uh, the first brothers uh, came from – uh, Connecticut, and uh, they spent. They wanted to live a more contemplative uh, life than was possible in the uh, in the community where they formerly were a part of, and so about twelve of them went out uh, and began New Skeet. Well, one of the brothers, of uh, the founding brothers, happened to have a German Shepherd uh-huh. that he was taking care of, uh, and the dog's name was Kier. Uh, and Kier became sort of like a community mascot. Right. And he was essential during those first uh, years uh, because he helped keep things loose and relaxed. Uh, He'd play with all of the different brothers. Naturally, brothers would take him out for a walk and, you know. uh, But his character was such that he was just really a a fun-loving, joyous dog. And, well, after two years, unfortunately, Kier died. And the brothers felt that loss so deeply that they just decided they had to get another one. Uh, another one. Mm-hmm. Well, as it happened, they wound up contacting a very well-known breeder uh, at the time in uh, western Massachusetts who managed to convince them to take two – breeding quality young dogs uh, that were about, I believe, about six or seven months old at the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, she, in the course of this, she said, you know, I have to tell you, these are really well-bred quality breeding shepherds. And given the fact that, uh, you know, you're you're challenged to support yourselves, one thing you might want to consider is uh, breeding them and then selling the puppies. And this was in the 60s as well? This was in the 60s. It was probably 1968. Okay. Uh, And so as it happened, that's what the brothers did. And what they found was 
there was a real, if you want to call it, demand for puppies. They were able to place the puppies quite easily. Uh, and I think people were sort of charmed with the idea of getting a puppy that was raised... From the monks. From a monk, yeah. you know, from the monks. And so, uh, well, it's funny what happens when, you know, uh, you've got a group of hungry monks who are trying to make ends <laughs> meet. Uh, yeah. I think the idea sort of naturally germinated that, well, you know, what would it be like if each brother took care of one or two dogs uh, themselves? Uh, we've seen how the relationship between the dog and the individual brothers has benefited sure. uh, the spiritual life of the community. How about if we uh, expand the number of dogs that we have and uh, that way each brother can give that personal attention that is required uh, to the dog that they're caring for. The dogs can learn to live in a certain sense as a pack. Yeah. Uh, and we can breed the dogs and perhaps that might be a way that we could really help support ourselves. Financially. And financially. Yeah. And so that's what we did. And, you know, to make a long story short, uh, anytime that you have, let's say, 10 or 12 dogs living in under one roof, yeah. well, you can imagine yeah. they have to be really well behaved. One of the brothers was particularly gifted in uh, in training, and he took it upon himself to teach the other brothers how to both train and care uh, for their dogs individually. And uh, so... As a result, when people, guests and visitors would come to the monastery and they'd see a group of well-behaved German shepherds, they'd say, gosh, I wish my dog could do that. And like, germinates the next like uh, all, thing. Right. You know, well, why can't we train other people's dogs to uh, to be well-behaved and uh, uh, teach them uh, how to care, teach the people yeah. how to care for the dogs? So that was how the training program began. And so things just sort of developed organically uh, those first years. And uh, lo and behold, uh, in a way that can only be described as a gift and as grace, uh, I think the uh, monastery began to acquire a reputation of being able to provide really sound German shepherds for those that wanted German shepherds, but also had a training program that uh, that people found very helpful. Okay, and so uh, and where does where does so you, the monastery and then the dogs came up came about. Where does uh, the connection between uh, the monks like the, where does God connect um, the monks and and the dogs together? Is there is there history on that where um, it, it, everything kind of came together compatibly with? Um, the dogs kind of help with the religion and faith and, and commodity within the brothers and the dogs together? I think that naturally in a monastery, everyone is trying to uh, to seek God, okay? And in what I would call a healthy monastery, that occurs in all of the different dimensions of our life. Not just simply in church, or not just simply in the times when we are in silent meditation. I think a lot of people have the idea that uh, spirituality involves church and the real world is the nuts and bolts, you know, nine to five, yeah. you know, uh, which really isn't too spiritual at all. Well, I think what we discovered is that rather the dogs were an amazing uh, agent for insight into ourselves. Right. For okay. happiness. And That's right. But also for self-knowledge. Why? Because dogs are utterly guileless. Yeah. Okay. They reflect us back uh, to ourselves in ways that sometimes don't happen in our human relationships. Our human relationships can sometimes be deceptive and guarded, where with a dog, 
what you see is what you get. Yeah. And so if you're paying attention to what the dog is communicating to you, it makes for some pretty sobering insights in terms of, for example, my self-centeredness, uh, my uh, emotional uh, imbalance at times, mm -hmm. uh, uh, as well as shirking uh, the ordinary responsibilities that I have for caring for another living creature. Now, the flip side of that is what happens when we cooperate with Together, right? the dog and uh, accept the responsibility. And all of a sudden, the relationship becomes something that is uh, hard to describe. Uh, you become aware of the fact that all of life is interconnected, okay? Yes, the dog is a separate species. But at the same time, uh, the relationship that we share... Uh, with the dog makes you just immediately aware of the mystery of life. You know, Yeah. consider uh, who would have ever thought, uh, for example, uh, 30,000 years ago, okay, that our own consciousness of our place in the universe would have an important component in the relationship between the human mm -hmm. and the dog, Uh probably didn't occur to them. Uh, however, I, I think our ancestors, what they did recognize is that dogs were, uh, were vital to their own well-being, uh, both on a practical level in terms of helping with hunting or herding or, yeah. or, you know, any one of a number of things. But also because of that, I think so many human beings became aware of just this unique bond that uh, that began to exist that really uh, came into being between the human being and the dog and uh, to put it mildly uh, when it's working it just enriches our lives in ways that we can't even really begin to pay back right and um, I think it's it's a great way to put it and I think um, professionally working with dogs and being around dogs so much, sometimes you don't realize that when you don't have that, you know, meaning if you were to go on vacation for two weeks and you couldn't touch a dog, you don't realize how much they actually, like for me, they ground me a lot. Mm -hmm. They balance me out. Um, meaning, um, you know, there's a lot of things going on in the world that may be, um, especially with, with, with the news and politics and social sure. media, it takes sure. over your, your happy place, if you will. Mm -hmm. and, and you kind of get lost in that sometimes where you think the world's ending and everything bad is happening. And then you start kind of working with your dog or you just go on a walk with your dog. And I think it's really grounding. And I think a lot of people who have dogs don't get to uh, enjoy that 100 percent because of their relationship is, is, is not great. And I think that that's where um, – you know, talking about some of the stuff that some of the stuff that you've done in the past is, um, I, I share a lot of values with with what you do and building a good relationship with your dog, um, and I think the relationship is just as important as the the technol the, the technical um, training that we do using tools and positioning and, and commands. That's right. That's the right. relationship is just as important. Yeah, unless the tools are serving the relationship, right? Uh, then it winds up becoming something that is very limited. And uh, what do you mean by that? Like, you mean if we're if we're really uh, hoping that the tools are going to work, and you're 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 depending on these things, is yeah. that what you mean? For example, if I want to use the tool solely to command the dog into this particular thing, or you know, this particular exercise, or that particular position, for example, if my relationship with the dog is structured simply on do this, do that. Okay, well, that's an extremely limited way of looking at the relationship. Yeah. Whereas if I'm rather using the tools for a process of training that allows me to include the dog optimally in my life, okay, yeah. allows us to share this relationship in a calm and re relatively uh, uh, easy uh, give and take relationship. Mm -hmm. Well, to me, that's how I 
like to look at training. Training is serving that. It's not just simply putting on uh, right. six commands on the dog that the dog can do by rote and uh, and just simply leaving it at that. Uh, that right uh, to me is. And you want uh, you want these commands to – you don't want to take a dog out and say, look what my dog can do. Sit down, heel, place, that's right. et cetera. You want these commands to he- to help the dog commingle and coexist with your life. Yeah. So if you're out playing uh, with a ball or a tug toy or you're just out enjoying a walk, you want your recall to be good because mm-hmm. – in case you need to recall your dog. You want your down to be good just in case you need to make your dog go down for whatever position. So I think a lot of people miss the idea of some of the commands or behaviors we teach the dog is actually to help the relationship. It's not all about my dog knows six great commands. It's about my dog knows commands to help better our relationship rather That's than right. flashy, look what I can do. Yeah, it's right? absolutely the case. Yeah. Absolutely. And you've been you've been training, third, would you say, 37 years? 37 years. Wow. Yeah. So that's way longer than I've been alive. So <laughs> that's that's pretty remarkable. So you've been training 37 years. You've How many books have you been a part of or written or co-written? Well, uh, I've been a part of – Probably about uh, six or seven wow. uh, major books. Uh, um, most recently, uh, uh, we've been involved in uh, in a book project that came out uh, in last fall called "Let Dogs Be Dogs," in which we co-authored with Mark Goldberg, mm-hmm. who is a, a, a very wonderful trainer. And a dear friend, uh, he lives in uh, Illinois. Mm-hmm. Uh, and but prior to that, we had uh, been well known for "How to Be Your Dog's Best Friend," uh, which was originally published in 1978, wow. and then uh, "The Art of Raising a Puppy," which was published in 1991, and then we did a uh, a book on the spiritual life. Uh, called In the Spirit of Happiness. Okay. And then uh, there was a book that was uh, based on uh, a TV series that we did for a season called Divine Canine. Uh, uh, It came out in in probably around 2008, something like that, eight or or nine. And that was on a network? Yeah, it was on Animal Planet. Awesome. for uh, uh, For a season. I mean, imagine monks on TV. It's, uh, <laughs> it was quite a an, quite an experience. Yeah, uh, not you, a bad experience at all. It was a good experience. But and you, you guys, do you don't have cell phones or anything, right? You guys are kind of off the grid, right? Yes, that's right. Because not because we don't care to. It's just there are no towers, and so as a result, uh, yeah, you know, uh, when guests and visitors come, they often you know, freak out because they don't have reception. Uh, reception. And uh, they have to go into town, you know, which is about four or five miles away to uh, uh, to get yeah. cell phone reception. Yeah. And I want to, um, you know, paint a picture for the listeners out there who aren't watching this uh, on the video. And um, we're we're kind of nestled uh, right now. It's spring in, in upstate New York. So everything's green. Everything is is really coming to life. The birds are chirping. There's dogs uh, wandering everywhere. Barking um, in the background. Barking in the background. Um, but I mean, there's birch trees and everything's green and flowers are here and, and, and it's, it's a really beautiful, um, place to be. And, and there's kind of people walking German shepherds all over the place. And, um, it's a very, uh, it's a place of harmony between dogs and, and, and humans. It seems, it seems like, uh, you guys are very compatible. Even the people who are handling dogs, everybody's kind of really uh, working towards a better relationship and, and better understanding. Um, and you guys are taking your time doing this. And so explain to me and anybody out there that is curious, what's your whole philosophy on dog training uh, as far as techniques, um, how and why it's important to build a relationship and and balance and things like that. So just touch base on that. Well, I think uh – a way to look at it is instead of looking at the dog as an object or a commodity that we control, it's 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 a separate being, okay? And when a dog comes into our life, it's not as though uh, it's something that we possess uh, uh, in an entirely self-centered way. Rather, 
we've been entrusted with the care of a, another creature, mm -hmm. okay? A creature that has the capacity of giving us an awful lot of joy, and mm -hmm. we, in turn, can give uh, the creature, you know, this dog, uh, a lot of happiness and fulfillment as well. And so, given that type of a context, uh, I look at the training process as how can I enhance and make that happen mm -hmm. in uh, in just what I would call a very natural and good way, okay? And so, as I had said earlier, to me, the approach that we have developed over the years, uh, I think, has evolved naturally, organically, uh, into how we're training right now. Because always what we're looking for is uh, to what extent does our particular method contribute to a wonderful relationship between dog and owner? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what the criterion, uh, you know, really is. And so, you know, when we first started, we basically learned everything that we could uh, from uh, – a vast cohort of trainers, mm -hmm. okay, who had been training for, for many years. Uh, and we sort of had a natural laboratory here, okay? When you're training year-round and you're usually working with five or six dogs, you know, at a time, mm -hmm. in the course of a year, you see an awful lot of different dogs. Uh, you see different behaviors. You see more importantly, different personalities. Yeah. Okay. Dogs are not all cookie cutter the right. same. Not every uh, shepherd. The that's same. right. Right. Uh, and so as a result, naturally you become aware of how to use the particular approach um, that, you know, we've developed here with one dog uh, and then how to use it with another where the personalities are, are very different. Naturally, over the years, yeah, we've had many dogs that have come in that have been, for example, very, very soft, okay? Uh, those types of dogs I have to work with in a different sort of way uh, than a dog that comes in who's a dominant Rottweiler, for example, and, and who's used to having his own way with uh, with yeah. his owner. That's the push and push uh, That's and push, right, and yeah. push and is, you know, being very assertive and... Uh, uh, and, and really challenging the owner's leadership, okay? And so what I keep coming back to is does the training process serve the relationship? And for the dogs that come in, what is absolutely the case is they are going to wear their experience on their bodies when the owners come back to pick them up, right. okay, and observe the dogs, you know, the demonstration, and you know, uh, the dogs are are going to wear that on yeah. their body. Dogs don't lie, right? Okay, yeah. So, for example, if the dog has had a miserable experience over the past two and a half weeks, uh, I can't go into the you know uh, in the morning and say uh, Blitz, hey, you really need yeah. to make this yeah. good for me. Gotta you make know, this work. yeah, we we. You know, your owner is going to be, uh, yeah. you know, looking. Don't don't humiliate me. Yeah. That's futile. Yeah. Uh, you know, because ultimately the owner is going to see the reality of the training process. Yeah. Okay. Now, fortunately, uh, I think that we stand by uh, the satisfaction of the vast, vast, vast majority of our customers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Who really are able to see an extraordinary difference uh, from how their dog was when the dog came in to how the dog is uh, at the time of its departure and what the program is for following that up after the dog yeah. gets back home. I mean, all of those are com you know important parts. Uh, but for, for myself, uh, what I have always tried to keep in mind is – uh, what serves the dog? What serves the relationship? What helps the dog become uh, uh, the best dog right. that the dog can be? And, you know, and uh, and to dig a little deeper on that for people who mm -hmm. probably want to know a little bit more about 
when you say what serves the dog. And when we talk about tools, we talk about slip collars, dominant dog collars, prong collars, e collars, etc. I think what you're what you're saying. Um, chime in on this after. Um, we're not so the dog comes in. So you do a two and a half week program, right? Yeah, that's right. To board and train. And so when the dog comes in, uh, the expectation of knowing the basic commands, even if they don't know any, are they? You know, th- those are preset. And and I think what you're what you're saying. Um, is when you tell a dog to me, or when you teach a dog a new behavior like down or sit, and they don't know it, the 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 end goal is to not pry the dog into submission. The end goal is to teach right. the dog the proper way, and through that process, you're using uh, corrections um, and and pressure to get the dog to understand what you're trying to mm-hmm. teach them. And Corrections to people who don't understand that um, it, it doesn't always have to be like we, we spoke about before. It's not a physical abuse thing it, by any means. A correction could simply be a spell check thing. If you spelled something wrong, I'm going to teach you how to spell it right, and then next time you'll know. Yeah. Right. And it doesn't have to be a painful thing. I think when people hear correction, um, when we're talking about dog training specifically, they always uh, assume that it's 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 the dog's beaten into submission. And so what you're saying is. Um, your end goal is is to to make the dog compatible with the with the commands and, and to st- want to obey right instead you know, of to yeah. to desire uh, to follow the leadership of the owner. Okay, that can be done in a very healthy and a very humane, uh, humane way. Right. What I like to usually say is there are three levels to the training process. There's the education or educative uh, level where we start out, where we're teaching the dog uh, uh, what the individual command might be. And in that, we're using, for example, often food reinforcement. Sure. Uh, We're taking a dog that doesn't understand a particular command and by virtue of our own uh, practice, you know, with them, we're teaching what the expectation is and associating that with a particular word yeah. that the dog then understands the command. Once the dog understands the command, then there we move to the reinforcement level where we're starting to hold the dog accountable to what it knows. And we'll use... Uh, uh, a little bit more uh, of a distraction right. uh, level. Right, a little harder. And, and it'll be just a little bit more pressure. Yeah. Uh, but not hard pressure at all. It's rather, uh, again, guiding uh, guiding the dog's understanding of what's expected in the particular uh, circumstance, mm-hmm. uh, the particular situation. Now, What usually will happen with most dogs is there's going to come a point where when the dog knows full well the command, knows what the expectation is, and the dog will at a particular point say, hey, you know that come thing? Yeah. Let me get back to you on that. Yeah. yeah. You know, I'll – Selective hearing. Yeah. Right. You know, it's it's entirely normal, Mm -hmm. okay? It's no – indication of the fact that you've got this miserable dog. Uh, no, it's simply a normal part of uh, a dog's growing and yeah. the dog's uh, uh, becoming uh, well-trained. Okay, when the dog decides okay, to resist or uh, to, let's say, not pay attention yeah. uh, to the particular command, okay, at that point, I'll introduce appropriate corrections that redirect the dog's focus and help the dog understand, oh, oh yeah. as a matter of fact, yeah, yeah, yeah. I do have to, to, yeah. to pay attention to that. And how I will do that uh, varies with each particular dog, but uh, certainly within the process, as I have said, if the dog is having this negative uh, compulsive experience, okay, that's going to be visible on the dog, okay? On the other hand, if the dog is uh, what I would say appropriately corrected, uh, then the dog is going to uh, to be able to say, oh, I get it, you know, yeah. uh, fine, you know, we're cool. And, and then 
in the course of uh, the training process, Mm -hmm. the dog learns that actually it's in everyone's interest. It's in its interest, certainly, to pay attention to yep. what the uh, trainer is is saying, and to, for example, ignore the particular distraction that might, you know, be going on. Uh, distractions are an important part of training. Why? Because life is made up. Real life is yeah. made up of distractions. Yeah. Uh, they're, it, they're absolutely unavoidable. So why not use distractions that test the dog's uh, willingness to uh, to obey? When, for example, a part of it might very well want to go chase yeah. the squirrel, for example, or something like that. Yeah, and they have to cooperate in a realistic yeah, environment. That's because, right. Um, if it, I, I've, I've had this um, conversation with two of my clients that recently came in um, yesterday, actually, two of them. Um, they, they do the, my dog knows, sit, and then sit, nothing, sit. <laughs> Nothing. Hold on. And they go and they grab cheese cubes and beef and things like right. that. And then it's right. like, well, who's training who here? And then we talk about the idea of my dog's great in the house. My dog is great, uh, you know, in the basement, in the driveway, maybe when there's nothing going on. But as soon as we get outside or as soon as we see another dog or as soon as we see another person, then we lose it. And then I have to explain to them in theory um, that – um, there's a certain part of the dog understanding what you want versus the dog not being put in these situations to um, obey uh, realistically, meaning um, if they actually know the commands in, in an environment that is a bit stressful, like environmental stressors, meaning you have squirrels running around you and the dog will still sit and stay, they probably know that. But if your dog will only sit and stay off of maybe what they feel like they should sit and stay on, meaning um, – I'm going to sit and stay inside because I'm going to get food and nothing's really going on and I don't really care. Yeah. And then as soon as we get outside, forget about it. And, and, and I think there's a fine line between, like I said before, does your dog actually know sit or does your dog actually know that when food or reward is present, they have to go into a certain position in order to get right. what they want and they're not really capturing the, the verbiage of the behaviors. That's correct. And it certainly is the case that uh, – there are going to be plenty of times when you'll be out in public, for example, and your dog couldn't care less about the Food. cheese, yeah. you know, the cheese bit or something yeah. like that. And uh, the dog is going to be interested in what it's interested in. And there's the rub. Okay, I need to be able to have the dog respond to what the dog knows uh, appropriately, precisely so that I can include the dog in these uh, various situations that naturally take place in my life. I mean, I want, it, I want my dog to be able to be with me. Right. Okay. Uh, if the dog is going to be with me, then um, the dog has to be able to utilize and incorporate uh, the commands that it's learned uh, uh, in a way that harmonizes with the particular situations that yeah. you know uh, that it will find in everyday life, and you know my experience just leads me to believe that uh, if dogs are able to be included in an owner's life, they're going to be happier. Right. Okay. They're going to uh, they're going to be more well adjusted, more socialized. Uh, right. You know, and so uh, so it's worth spending time on, let's say, the more proofing element of the training process, Mm -hmm. precisely because then it becomes much easier to apply that in everyday life for the owner. Yeah, absolutely. So realistically, um, doing sit and stay in your basement for two months, great, you're doing something with your dog, but if you don't get him out and do it in reality, then you're going to be very upset when you do. That's right. And I think an awful lot of owners who have a very narrow, one-dimensional uh, view mm-hmm. of the training process, I think they are afraid that when they go out in public that they're going to fail, uh, that they're going to fail, right? Or they're going to, for example, look foolish. Sure. Okay. When the dog isn't cooperating with them, instead of taking the uh, the opposite attitude of, hey, I got the opportunity right. to apply the training. Uh, to real life situations, 
And as long as I'm paying attention to the dog and what the dog is revealing to me, Mm -hmm. uh, to its body language, uh, it becomes an opportunity for... To get better. Yeah, to get better and a deeper... It it allows me to practice. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So it's... it's, uh, I think too oftentimes, though, people are afraid that uh, they're going to screw up the training... Okay, by exposing the dog to real life mm-hmm. situations when, in point of fact, that's the bread and butter yeah. of the relationship. And I think training as, as the word, if you're training for a triathlon, if you're training for a, fo- a food eating contest, mm-hmm. you're, you're, the training aspect is not the, the game. Mm-hmm. The game is reality, I think, in dog training. I think the training aspect is very uh, relationship building. But what are you training for? You have to be training for – Something, and I think what people miss about that is, like you were saying, is is they do it in, in an area that is is secluded to them and their success, and then as soon as they go outside, they may feel like they're going to fail. But the training aspect, just like if you're training to run ten miles a day, you don't start with running ten miles a day. You start at one mile, and then you move forward yeah. two miles, three miles, and so you condition sure. and you and training to me is practice. Mm-hmm. I take training away and just say you're practicing. What are we practicing for? A realistic uh, environment to have a, a, a social dog in, in, in our life. And moving forward from that, um, being a, you know, a monk, um, you know, you guys are, you're, I was, I was kind of doing some research on it and you guys, um, the three ma- major things that you guys focus on is obedient. What, what is it? Obedience. And what are the other things that I was reading? Oh, are you talking about the vows that we take? Uh, I don't know. Is there three vows? Because there was obedience. Well, what was it, Jason? It was obedience, poverty, chastity, pov- yeah, and yes. obedience. Yes. Okay. So when you're when you're talking about obedience with dogs, um, I mean monks are known as very peaceful people who who find religion and and live amongst themselves in peace. Mm-hmm. What is your take on correcting um, a dog um, after they know the positioning? Meaning. Once the dog fully knows what you want and they say, I don't want to, what is your – you've been training dogs for almost 40 years. Yeah. That's a lot longer than a lot of people have, have been introduced to dogs, let alone professionally sure. trained. Mm-hmm. What's your take on correction-based training versus a, a one-dimensional or a, a, a style of, of maybe purely positive or, or something like that? Well, let's take a look at the very notion of obedience, OK? Obedience comes from the Latin word abadire, which means to listen. Wow, I didn't okay. know that. So uh, most people have this understanding of obedience is I do what I don't want to do because bad things are going to happen if I don't. Okay. Right. When good. in like point it. of fact, the real notion of obedience implies listening. It implies cooperating with another. Now, in my life, it means I have to listen to God, for example. Mm-hmm. So if I'm obedient to God, I'm listening to God. And the fruit of that is a good relationship, a better relationship. Uh, now, with respect to uh, uh, a relationship with a dog, part of what I want to the dog to come to understand is that uh, it's in the dog's interest to listen to me. Right. Uh, And in the training process, what the dog comes to to see uh, very clearly is, gee, it's things go so much smoother, so much better. I'm happier. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm able to enjoy uh, the the process to the extent that I pay attention, that I listen. When I don't, okay, I'm redirected, refocused, okay. Uh, but then all of a sudden, when I uh, when I choose to obey, all of a sudden there is the positive affirmation, there's the praise, there's drawing the dog out of itself, and the dog really starts to enjoy. The fact that, and, yeah, the yeah. confidence and it's sort of it's encouraged. Okay, that's all part of the process. I want to woo the dog into really choosing the relationship mm-hmm. rather than just simply, right. uh, you know, I'm going to do my own thing. And, and by, you know, over the course of two and a half weeks, uh, 
it's amazing how that transformation happens. Uh, so anyway, uh, what I'm not looking for in my own relationship is primarily a thou shalt do this. Yes, right. Okay. Rather, uh, I'm looking for something a lot uh, more relaxed, natural, but at the same time is dead serious. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things that I think an owner needs to accept is they actually know far better than their dog what's in the dog's best interest. And they have, much like a parent with a child, the right. responsibility to guide the dog uh, to what they know is going to uh, serve not only the relationship or serve the overall health of the dog. Right. Uh, that's a responsibility that the owner has. And if they shirk that responsibility, shame on them. Mm-hmm. And it's it's the same thing as parenting, and and I think even relationships with um, people who have relationships not only with friends and family and significant others, etc., is you we we don't we don't even think about sh- should I punish my child for running across the street without asking or looking? Right. We don't think about punishing a child for kicking and spitting on a principal or another human, and. We, and the, the good the good thing about the versatility of punishment it is is it, it doesn't always have to be I'm going to beat my children or I'm going to grab them by their hair not at all no. it could simply be explaining to them what they've done wrong taking maybe something away the TV the cell phone uh, video games candy and and having some sort of punishment or correction to to highlight and show the the subject or your child or your dog or whatever you're responsible for that what you have just done is is not right. And I think that when we talk about human psychology, we have no problem doing that with humans and teaching them. Of course, we don't want them to get hurt. Why would we let them run across the road? But for some reason, we have this ideology of this this relationship with dogs where we can't punish them. And I, and I, and I truly believe this, that – one of the biggest reasons why people choose to do uh, purely this, that, or the other thing on any level is because they don't know how else to do it. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of people out there coming out with this new, I believe, marketing thing of um, natural dog training with, with, with purely positive reinforcement training included and um, them ignoring bad behavior and, and rewarding good behavior. Um, and, and we had a conversation off camera and off audio that – it was great because I say it, I say it a lot too. Is I, a good dog trainer is ninety five percent positive. Yeah, great. You do, you've done what I've asked. We're building a relationship. Then you get maybe that three to five percent of no. You can't run across the street. And when I say you have to stay there, it's because there's a dangerous dog or there's whatever. And I and I think that people miss that. Is they think that they, they they see a correction like an e collar or, or, or tool like that that can correct a dog. But it doesn't always mean that we have to use it. It's just it's it's there to help build a relationship. That's right. Right. I, I mean, I think that. Look, one of the realities of today's training culture is the fact that it's a polarized world. Okay, uh, unfortunately, uh, very oftentimes. Uh, balanced trainers and purely positive trainers wind up uh, talking at cross purposes towards each other. They mm-hmm. can't really hear what the other is saying. I have no problem with an individual who chooses to train using purely positive methods. If that's their particular uh, way of training, okay, knock yourself out. God bless you. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, uh, personally, I fall into the balanced training uh, camp. Uh, and what I would say, though, that I have real difficulties with is when there's moralizing that goes with, right. uh, for example, the purely positive uh, 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 crowd where they'll judge a, uh, let's say, a balanced trainer independent of the product that is resulting from right. the balanced trainers right. uh, because it doesn't fit with their particular political ideology. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, ipso facto, things like uh, p- 
two-prong collars or remote collars or even slip collars, uh, sometimes even halties yeah. and uh, you know transitional leads or mm-hmm. head halters. Uh, uh, those are all verboten. Uh, why? Because they uh, uh, they exert a certain amount of pressure on the relationship that uh, that particular approach feels is Im- immoral. You know, is is actually dis- really a disservice to the dog. Now, uh, as a result, their approach is very uh, behaviorally narrow. Okay, they can use a clicker, for example, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, clicker is a great tool. Okay, but a clicker is really not going to help you too much when uh, you're trying to deal with, uh, for example bad behavior and, and the dog is ignoring food, for mm-hmm. example. Or I'm not hungry uh, anymore. Yeah, that's right. Or, you know, for example, the uh, the trainer simply turns and the dog perpetually s- jumping up, you know, on yeah. them. I mean, something so simple as that. Well, from my particular approach, uh, I would much rather uh, let the dog know that is inappropriate Uh and then follow it up with several things where it gets the dog out of itself and back to focus with me what, as opposed to, to just do. simply right. doing what it, it wants. Absolutely. Right. Now, like I said, my suspicion is trainers will be arguing uh, until eternity about sure. which particular approach is best. Uh, okay. But the thing that I am – deeply conscious of is in the 37 years that I've been training, okay, if dogs were leaving this training program timid, fearful, uh, 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 shut down, shut down, right. anything like that, I would be seeing that. Instead, and you what probably I wouldn't see, have a, you probably and, wouldn't have would, dogs. and we wouldn't have a training yeah. program. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Instead, <laughs> what I'm seeing is dogs that are able, uh, that are happy, that are well adjusted. Okay, they've learned what they need to learn, and they're at a point now where they can take the next step in their relationship with their owners. Okay, that's what we really strive to provide, and that's what I think we're pretty successful at doing. Okay, I resent it when trainers that have never been here simply say, oh, they use prong collars or they use remote collars. Yeah. So therefore, they have to be mean, hard-nosed monks who, who actually... <laughs> Doesn't even make sense. It's, it's, they're on a power trip. I resent that. Right. Uh, I mean, I just don't have any patience for it because it is so patently false. It is just absolutely wrong. Uh, uh, and so... Do I have strong opinions about this topic? Of course I do. You know, uh, I feel that, for example, uh, people that critique our use of remote collars, okay, well, again, I think that the question that I would often ask them is, oh, so, for example, in dog training, unlike other professions, technology is not uh, ever to be right. uh, advanced. utilized, yeah. advanced. Yeah. You know, for example, uh, you know, uh, it would be as if I went into a dentist's office and said, "Hey, uh, skip the drills and and everything. <laughs> and Can you just yeah?" And Novocaine, let me out. just uh, just do it. Let's do it. Nineteen twenty uh, <laughs> type of yep. uh, uh, dentistry. Does that make any kind of sense? No. Now, I'm the first one to acknowledge that any tool, any tool, can be misused. And any tool can be counterproductive to the training process if it's used incorrectly. But I will tell you, I have found that um, what we've learned about dog behavior and uh, about how to use effectively uh, training tools and and resources can really make a huge Huge. difference, huge difference uh, in, uh, in the happiness of dogs. And I've I've even found um, saving lives. Yeah, it's come, absolutely. It's come down to this. I, it's usually for me, at, and, and what I do is I've been to three other trainers, four other trainers, and that doesn't make me better. It just makes me um, be more versatile, 
where they've mm-hmm. done one thing. And I said, well, have you tried this? No. Well, let's look into it. And then uh, I've even personally I, – I, I got into the industry to – because I love dogs and I want to help people connect with them on a different level. And if you only offer one type of style, you're one dimensional. You you can only cook one way or you can only work on one type of car, which means how many people can you actually help yeah, or, or that's fulfill? Right. No, that's right. Well, uh, I know that you're short on time, Brother Christopher. Um, thank you so very much for having us. Um, this has been amazing. Um, and this is like a this is like a dog sanctuary. I was telling Jason coming up, I'm like I want to become a monk. This is just beautiful. Hey, we're here. (laughs) Uh, I appreciate it so very much. Okay. I appreciate it.